Thank you very much for that introduction, and, and thank you very much for having me. Good morning, everyone. All right, that's, that's, it's, it's good. Sometimes I do that and people are just, they just sit there and I have to do it again. So good morning, folks. Good morning, Toronto. It's wonderful to be here. My name is George Hemingway and I'm here to talk to you about the three keys to conquering uncertainty. We're gonna talk about the future. We're gonna talk about change. We're gonna talk about what we can do to meet it and succeed. I'm gonna throw everything in the kitchen sink at you and I'm gonna talk a lot about something other than mining. Because, well, let's face it, there are a lot of people in this room that understand mining, but I promise you, seemingly it, it, it'll be all about, my, not about mining, but at the end I'll bring it all back together, it'll have something to do with the mining industry. So just, just bear with me, eventually the word mining will show up sometime in here. Before I, uh, I launch into my presentation, just a little bit about me. I, I am a partner and I run a practice for a growth strategy and innovation consultancy. We help companies to become future focused and to, to deal, especially in very uncertain markets, and we do this for a lot of industries across a, a number of different sectors, including most of the major mining companies. And so uncertainty is what we do. It's no surprise uncertainty is one of what I'm gonna talk about, and my goodness, do we live in uncertain times. If anyone wants to disagree with me, I'm happy to have an eight hour long conversation with you after this speech on why it's true. But the truth is we've always lived in uncertain times. As human beings, we feel that the time we're in right now is more uncertain than everyone that, that came before us, but there is something different about the uncertainty that we're facing today. And it is that the world is changing at a different pace than it has before in the past, and we're having a hard time dealing with it and meeting that uncertainty. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But when we talk about uncertainty, it's not this uh, fixed thing. It's kind of like uh, innovation or digital. It, it, it's got a wide spectrum of uses, and we think of uncertainty in a spectrum, right? There are some things that I am less uncertain about. I have some clarity about. For example, I am pretty sure, every time I say this, I worry, I'm pretty sure the sun will rise tomorrow, right? I've got some clarity around that. Then there are other things that I'm a little bit less certain about, but I can visualize. Um, let's take 3D printing. Uh, I think 3D printing is going to have an impact on the world around me. I'm not exactly entirely sure how, but I can think of some scenarios of how that might play out. Not 100% certain, but, but you know, I've got some thoughts around it. And then there are things I'm truly uncertain about. Uh, will we invent a technology that fundamentally changes the way we live? Will an asteroid hit the Earth tomorrow? I don't know. And it's this kind of uncertainty that often people talk about when they talk about black swan events, right? Truly uncertain sort of things. But what we have found in our research and our work is that companies that do well in meeting uncertainty do three things very well. One, they face the future. They consider what's coming in terms of trends and changes in behaviors and, well, uncertainties. And they prepare to think about what that means for their businesses. Two, they consider the showstoppers. As human beings, we're really good at thinking about the future and, and setting something in stone, but we're not so good about considering the things that would stop us from getting to our future. So companies that succeed consider the showstoppers. And three, they're prepared to pivot because no matter how good you are at predicting the future, you're going to get it wrong. So you've got to be flexible, and you've got to be as flexible as the future is uncertain. And I'll talk about all three of these today, but you can't talk about uncertainty without talking about the future. So you say, well, okay, well, let, let's discuss the future for a minute. I mean, uh, if I just think about the fact that the future is coming and, and, and it's going to be a, a different sort of pace, shouldn't I be prepared for it? Well, the reason is no, and, and, and the answer is no, and the reason is that human beings suck at dealing with the future. Because here's the thing, we like certainty. When I think about the future, when we all think about the future, I kind of view it in a linear way. I'm here, the present, and I'm going over there. The future, and we do this in our businesses. We set visions of the future, five, 10. Here's an example. When I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a Broadway singer. And I'm obviously not a Broadway singer. And the reason is, is that the future didn't quite turn out the way that my first six years did, which I sang all the time, and apparently my parents went crazy and said, you know, maybe singing's not what you should be doing. So the future really isn't, isn't a linear place. What we do, though, is that when we predict the future, as all of us try and do, we're usually either precisely right or, more likely, precisely wrong. And everything in the middle, well, well, that's uncertainty, right? And just to put this in very human terms, and since it's the right week for it, I would like you to imagine for a moment that you are a turkey. 
And do you live on a turkey farm? It's a beautiful turkey farm. It's a, it's a high class operation, right? You've got lots of turkey friends to play with. You've got lots of turkey food to eat. You've got lots of space to run. Yeah, very high class, run by Donald Trump. The Donald Trump before Donald Trump. And, and, and let's say I go up to you, right, on, on the 100th day uh, of your life, right, and I ask you in my best Turkish, Mr. Turkey, tell me, how's life? You might say to me, well, I've got a lot of friends to play with. I've got a lot of food to eat, right? I've, I've got Donald Trump as my landlord. I'd say life is pretty good. And then Thanksgiving. Now, the mistake the turkey made is the mistake we all make, right? I make it, you make it, business makes it. It's that we think that our future is an extension of our past. And we make that mistake, and then we miss Thanksgiving coming along. Now you say, OK, well, that's fine. George, I get it. You know, just recognize that my future isn't like my past. I should, be, I should be fine. And that was easier to do in the past than it is today. As I mentioned, change is changing. And we need to change the way that we think about change. Because the world is accelerating and switching around and moving in ways and speeds that it didn't do before in the past. And there are really two reasons I would like to talk about. There are many, but these two, I believe, are, are two of the most important. They are technology and humanity. So what you've got in front of you over here is basically the first, let's call it the uh, census of, of, of in the history of, of humankind. Let's say back in 10,000 BC, people would go around, they'd knock on your cave door, right? They'd ask you lots of personal questions, right? That people didn't like it back then either, right? But back then, if they did that, we would find that, you know, there were about mm, 100 million people on Earth, give or take, up until about the time of Christ, right? 12,000 years, we're pretty stable in terms of our population. And then about 2,000 years ago, who knows why, people start migrating, so forth and so on, we up the number a little bit. We go from 100 million to a billion people, a billion people on Earth. Then about 150 years ago, something really weird happened. I don't know, they put something in the water. And we went from a billion people to the seven billion people we have today, and on and on and on. And hopefully, like every good S-curve, this will even out at some point. Otherwise, we're in, we're in real trouble. So what does it mean? More and more people on Earth and the population accelerating and accelerating in terms of its growth. What's happening in the same 150-year lifespan? Well, if you look back, we've invented more in the last century than we have in all of human history combined. And not only are we inventing more and being able to do more, we're adopting it faster and faster. Whereas it took 46 years for 25% of the US population to have a telephone, it took only three years. I'm sorry, electricity, it took only three years for 25% of the US population to have a smartphone, three months for Pokemon Go, and so forth and so on. What that means in terms of technology and humanity is that there are more people on Earth and more people coming faster and faster. And they're able to do more and more and demand more and more. And as people and as companies, we're having a harder and harder time accepting and adapting to that change. To put it in more human terms, I would like you to imagine for a minute you could invent a time machine. You went back to 1750. You picked up this fine-looking gentleman with the little frills over there. Right? We haven't really come that far in terms of fashion, apparently, in 250 years. And let's say you took him back in time 250, 250 years into the past. Let's say you took him to the 1500s. He'd look around and he'd say, well, you know, we have a better understanding of our place in the cosmos today, better understanding of medicine. We have better fashion. But for the most part, I could live in the year 1500. Now let's say you took that very same gentleman, moved him the same period of time into the future, to the year 2000. His mind would be blown. By our understanding of our place in the cosmos and, 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 and medicine and, and our changes in our culture and society, you could argue that in fact that individual would be unable to adapt to the year 2000. Why? Same period of time, but the rate of change has been so much faster and continues to move quicker and quicker and quicker. And we're seeing it not just in terms of humanity, but also in terms of companies. If you look at the average lifespan of a company on the S&P 500, you notice it is declining and it is becoming shorter and shorter because companies are unable to adapt to the rate of change. Now we see this in our very lives. Uh, who apart from me owned all of the things in this, in this room at some point? This is 1990. Am I the only geek in here? Should have a conversation. All right, good. Th thank you very much for being a fellow geek. All right, so you look at this, right? Th this, this gentleman over here, this fine-looking fellow, 
25 industries, you needed a whole room to hold them all, right? And overnight, 2007, all of them in your pocket, 25 industries gone. Consider this for a minute. It's only been a decade since the iPhone came out. Only a decade. And in that decade, how many businesses have been disrupted? How many businesses have been destroyed? How many new industries have emerged? How has our life fundamentally changed because of the smartphone? Even the advances in that alone have been incredible. And the impact they have on so many industries and businesses. One decade. What could happen to your industry in a decade? Now, the interesting thing is that other industries have changed, right? This is from the 40s or the 50s. Look at education, right? It's kind of cute, right? You see someone learning digitally, right? You've got videos up there, and then and the students are using these computery things, and, and they're talking to a teacher who's thousands of miles away. I mean, this is reality. This happens now, right? These online courses, universities absolutely being disrupted. Our businesses learning in new and different ways, right? But how about the mining industry? Has the mining industry changed? Well, it has, but there are reasons the mining industry hasn't changed as fundamentally as some others. There are a great many. I'm going to focus on three. One, the world needs mining, right? Our customers are captives. For now, the metals, the minerals, what comes out of mining, you've got a captive customer set. That's a good thing, right? Nothing has yet you know, shown up that's going to replace, oh, I don't know, copper, OK? So there you go, Cap captive customers. Governments are dependent on mining. In fact, in, in especially in specific countries, right? They are a source of income, they're a source of jobs. And so while there are more and more challenges every day with regulators and governments, the truth is the two need each other. And the third thing is marklets are, well, forgiving in their own way. Although everyone complains about the cyclicality of markets, right, and that you've got the up cycle and the down cycle, the good news is that we all know that what goes down eventually comes up. And the markets are willing to fund it. And because of that, right, mining companies and mining industry has license to operate. They've got built-in demand, and they've got access to capital. All things you need. And because of that, the mining industry really hasn't felt the need to change for a great deal. Not the same as how other industries have felt. And so while the rest of the world gets smaller, it's a, it's a mini tank, by the way. It can invade Libya by itself, apparently. The mining industry gets larger. While the rest of the world becomes more modular, the mining industry spends more on infrastructure and capital, more stuck in a specific location and in a specific way, and committed. And while the rest of the world gets more diverse, the mining industry looks a little bit like the Lego management team a few years ago. <laughs> they added a woman, so it's all OK now. now. The problem, though, isn't change. Change is fine. The problem is how we deal with change. And companies that succeed facing change do three things well. They face the future. They consider what it means. They consider those showstoppers. And they prepare to pivot. I'm going to start a little bit by talking about facing the future. So when it comes to facing the future, you know, a lot of companies ask us to help them think their, through their vision of their future, whether it's a mind of the future or their strategy of the future. And when they do that, and they ask us, you know, what do we do with this digital thing, and how do we prepare for it, what they often ask us is, what technology should I invest in? And there's a reason for that. Technology in a world that is uncertain is a tangible thing. You can touch it. You can feel it, right? And, and there's a good reason to love technology today, because a lot of the stuff that we viewed as science fiction is now fact. And that's wonderful. That's an absolutely wonderful thing. But the problem is that the future is not about technology. Digital is not about technology. It's about understanding where value is coming from and adapting your business to that value and understanding what it means specifically for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about value and how I think we may be missing the boat just a tad with it. So when you look at industries that become disrupted, they tend to follow a pattern. Four things. One, the new entrants are unconstrained by the platform that the old entrants had. If you think about it, um, Uber didn't have to buy a million taxis. Okay? They had a different platform. They, they were able to compete in a different way. Right? The capital markets treat them a bit differently. There's a reason why technology companies have this wonderful multiple. Right? They just throw money at them, whether they make money or not. Right? They're industries usually where the world wants to see some sort of change, whether it's the customer or the market around them. And the new entrants are willing to ignore or totally play by new rules than their competitors. Back to Uber for a second. Who cares if it's illegal? No one's going to catch us until they do. And by that time, it's too late. So you look at this from a practical example, something that's big in real world. Look at Netflix. right? Blockbuster, 
made 40% of its profitability from late fees. Only 18% of its revenue, but all of its profitability, anyone that, that has a credit card or goes to a bank or rented at Blockbuster knows what I'm talking about. Late fees is how they made their money. Netflix shows up, forced them to get rid of late fees, so they went ahead and they did, because they had no choice, but the infrastructure they had, right, that they were committed to, meant that they had to reinstate it. By that point, it was too late. Company played by different rules, had a different platform in order to live with, was able to operate in a different way, and nobody likes late fees anyway. But let's face it, mining is nothing like the retail industry, right? Mining has a lot of regulations and a lot of compliance, and, and it's got a lot of rules, and you guys are price takers, right? You're not price makers, and a lot of risk. Well, you know, we do a lot of work in banking, and it strikes me that mining's a lot like banking in some ways. Banking faces the same sorts of threats. And when you look at banking, banking is a very process-driven business, right? All those things they roll, they exist through process and compliance. Right? They're not very good at adapting quickly. And frankly, as we all know from our, our statements, they're, they're not particularly good at focusing on the customer. The rare exception are the ones that we write about in the news. So let's look at what banking does when banking faces challenges. Right? Banking faced a lot of regulatory challenges. They had a pressure to cut costs because regulations cost a lot of money. So in order to cut those costs, they pushed fees onto the customer. Right? Kind of much in the same way that you, you sort of kind of shrink and adapt and do what you can to succeed. Well, income technology players who don't care about making money, the markets throw money at them, right? They're doing something kind of quick and focused and agile, small, but successful. And you have a lot of happy but unprofitable customers. Well, what do the banks do when that happens? Because that's not good, right? Banks don't like that, right? So most of financial services goes ahead and does the digital thing. The same thing that, that well, all these big industrial companies are doing, right? The same products, the same silos, the same services, just better, faster, cheaper. Right, we're gonna mine, same kind of mining, same kind of ore body, same kind of, but just better, faster, cheaper. Better, faster, cheaper, lower cost, that's good, right? And so we, you know, I could see some parallels there, right? But the problem is the technology players come in and they don't wanna operate with the same platform or the same rules or the same constraints and they do something different. Most people don't know, but Amazon has loaned billions of dollars to businesses in the last couple of years. Now, normally you just shrug that off, but you look at what they do in pharma, you look at what they do in retail, you look at what they do in supermarkets, and you realize what this is is just a little test, a little test of what's to come. And Amazon is preparing to disrupt the banking industry the second they figure out how to deal with all those compliance and regulatory rules that the banking industry does, just like they did with supermarkets. They play by different rules. Look at uh, Walmart, look at uh, Target. Right? They, they, they follow the rules of business, right? 44 consecutive years of dividends, per share dividends doubling, right? These, these, are, these have changed a little bit recently. What does uh, Amazon do? They come in, they buy Whole Foods. It really just couldn't keep up with these guys anyway. What does the market do? Well, the market drops the value of the supermarket sector 70 to 20% in that short period of time, gives Amazon a 3% cap bump on that day, more than enough, by the way, to pay for all of Whole Foods and have a little leftover champagne. Take something that couldn't succeed, throw it under the banner of technology, and boom, suddenly you can afford champagne and your own organic vegetables. Playing by different rules. And the message here is that digital is not enough. Although technology will fundamentally change the mining industry, it will also erode the source of competitive advantage that previously existed as well. So let's talk about this for a second, right? We all know that the mining industry is going to go towards automation and predictive maintenance and, and all of these neat technologies. Well, in a world in which everything is automated, in a world in which the data lets you correct the machines and the machines correct themselves and everything optimizes and we all have access to the neat Caterpillar, Caterpillar Cisco, Komatsu, droney things, right? Because everyone tried developing it themselves. It didn't work. So eventually everyone's going to have the same stuff. Given two equal ore bodies, which I know doesn't happen, what will be the competitive differentiator? It's not going to be operations. It's not going to be the traditional thing that mining companies used to hang their hat on. Where is it going to come from? Technology will change the industry, but it will also erode the thing that the industry used to consider its fortress. And here's an interesting thought for you, right? 
in a world in which the world's largest taxi company owns no cars, the world's largest accommodation provider has no rooms, the world's largest content media company, at least for now, creates little or no content, could the world's largest mining company own or at least operate no mines and find advantage in a new way? It's not that crazy an idea. Even mining companies, big ones, that have thought about this as a potential way of operating. When I talked to one of the former heads of innovation at one of the big three, they said that when they'd done all their research and all their work, it wasn't necessarily the, the, the automation that was going to be the biggest driver of value or, or, or any of that stuff. It was going to be better knowledge of their ore bodies, better knowledge of what to trade in and out of, better knowledge of what to sell and what to buy, better knowledge of how to mine smarter while they mine. They saw that as the largest driver. Now, if your biggest source of advantage is ore body knowledge and operations are now at a parity, might you be a mining company that just doesn't operate or own the operations anymore? Might you think differently about what it means to be a mining company? Let's put technology aside for a second. Let's look at the other side of the equation, which is humanity and society. Right? Even in China, of all places, where they can kind of do whatever they want to do, they're facing social unrest, or at least they know they're going to face social unrest, around pollution, around environmental issues. So they're building hydro dams. They're canceling coal projects. And in a world in which we're seeing more and more concern about the impacts of the natural resources industry, when we're seeing risks that were just risks come into reality, when you're seeing actions by governments, what part of the mining industry do you want to play in? What, what's the one that's going to drive the most value? Now, here's a thought for you, right? Last year, Apple said that they want all of the metals that go into their phones to come from recycling one day. One day means they haven't figured out how to do it. But when Apple throws something out there, when they lay a chip on the table, let's say someone decides to pick it up. Let's say Apple finds a way to recycle enough metals that they can put them in their phones. Let's say they get good enough at that that they decide they want to do it for Samsung. And as long as they're doing it for Samsung, they'll do it for everybody. Could Apple become a mining company? And if Apple became a mining company, and they didn't have the mines, and they didn't have the infrastructure, and they didn't have the issues with the governments and the regulators, and they got money from the capital markets at a multiple that was silly, how would the mining industry compete? So whether you think it's going to be Apple or not, whether you think it's the undersea people, this is a real undersea miner, by the way, or the asteroid people, or the you know, chemicals mining people, also not real minerals. Change is coming eventually. And the question becomes how you're going to meet it and adapt for it. Remember the rules of what happened to industries that get disrupted. Industries where change is desired by the outside world, where the players are unconstrained by the operating platform of the past, where they're willing to ignore or play by new rules, and where the capital markets treat them differently. Could it happen? Yes, it could. Will it? Well, time will tell. The second part of facing the future is vision. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we more or less inherently understand it as companies. We set visions all the time. But as a mining industry, we tend to have a vision of the future, right? It's automated, it's predicted, it's going to be cool electric mines, uh, and, and so forth and so on. But the truth is the vision doesn't have to be the same. This is for a client that I worked for in the banking industry, right? They said, we don't want to be the McDonald's of banking, right? We don't want to be cheap and easy and everywhere. And we don't want to do the robo-advisor thing because that's customized, but it's robotic. No, we're actually going to invest in people. So they started hiring more people. This is a big American bank. They see the same technology as the rest of the industry. They had a different vision. Do you know what yours is and how it's different from the other players? What's also important about a vision is not just understanding what it is, but how it connects to the work you're doing today. And one of the reasons for this is that you've got to get permission to do what you're about to do. Because CEOs respond to shareholders. Shareholders have the, have the attention span of a firefly. So you've got to justify the work you do now so that you have permission to play. You can't say, in 10 years, I'll deliver you something because you won't be around, and we all know this at this point, because the industry has tried many, many, many times. The second of my three keys is considering the showstoppers, which I consider to be the funnest of them, because as human beings, we don't like to think about things not happening, much in the same way that, that, that we all should really plan our own funerals. It's a lot less expensive and a lot easier on everybody, but nobody really does. 
No one likes to think about the negative stuff. Again, let's talk a little bit about, about Uber for a minute because I love them. They're a great example of everything that can go right and everything that can go wrong. When you look at all the technology that makes them possible, the, the digital stack and the GPS and the phone and the automatic payments, it's not the technology that's the most amazing thing. It's her. It's the humanity. It's that we as brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and friends are okay standing on the street at 2.30 in the morning, hailing a total stranger in their really weird, smelly car, giving them our credit card information, letting them take us home, and somehow we arrive safely. And politicians and regulators and laws allow this to happen. I mean, imagine, like 1985, my mom calling me up from the airport and being like, hey, I need to get home. Hey, mom, don't worry. Just get a total stranger. Give him 20 bucks. You'll be fine. It's not the technology. It's the humanity that's the interesting thing. And when we look at the greatest uncertainty facing the mining industry, it is not the feasibility of technology or change. It is not the implementation of the technology or change from an operating point of view. It is the uncertainty of acceptance. Not can you do it, not how will you do it, but will you be allowed to try? And it's not just technology, it's everything around us. When you look at this big cluster that we call digital because we just have no other name for it, and we slam it all together, there are two things I'd like you to pay attention to, artificial intelligence and robotics, of all the trends that are out there. Why? Because artificial intelligence and robotics can fundamentally change our relationship with the world around us, how we work, and our very value within it. And that's different because, you know, there's been a talk about humanity versus technology for hundreds of years, right? The Luddites and everybody else saying they're going to take away our jobs, and for hundreds of years they were wrong. Productivity has increased, and we're all still here. And we see this in the movies, right? We like this myth, because it's true, right? You look at the hidden figures, right? And then the IBM put this really cool machine, Watson-y type thing in there. Watson still needs help, apparently. But they put that thing in there, and, and, and what? These wonderful women came in and, and made the machine work. It was humanity that was the key. But artificial intelligence and robotics change that fundamentally. What you have up here is a map of the most populous or most common job in the United States uh, by state. Everything in baby blue there is truck drivers. Interestingly enough, these are the same people that voted for Trump. Make of it what you will. Now, what you're looking at right here is auto. This is not new, by the way. This is old. I could put a Tesla up here if you wanted to. It is a partnership between Budweiser and auto. It's an autonomous 16-wheeler. It works. It's been around for years. I mean, this is, this is an old photo. This is grainy. It's not a drone. That's a helicopter taking that thing. How do you implement that in that world? It's not whether you can. It's whether you'll be allowed to. Now, let's look at the mining industry. Is the mining industry not trying to automate? Is the mining industry not trying to move away from humans underground? Is the mining industry not trying to move to artificial intelligence and natural language processing and machine learning and all these words that we don't really truly understand unless we do them? Yes. Will you be allowed to do it? It's not just technology. When you look at the other changes going on in the world right now, you ask, will I be allowed to make these changes? Well, I mean, look at, at, at the power of sovereign nations. Look at governments taking businesses away and owning them. And it doesn't matter if we're, we're talking about South America or we're, or we're seeing glimmers in other industries like, like the white-owned farms being taken in South Africa. How might this impact the mining industry everywhere? Now, let's face it, Canada is not Venezuela. And Canada is not South Africa. But are there glimmers, are there signs in Canada that, in fact, the permission for the mining company to mine where they want to mine, or that governments will force them to change the way that they operate, or that the concept of ownership itself may change? Are there societal things that could impact and exist as showstoppers to the mining industry? I argue to you that they are. And it's not just Canada, it's everywhere. Whether it is interference from governments in the United States, Canada, Brazil, Venezuela, South Africa, it is the uncertainty of acceptance, whether technology or not, that will impact whether or not we're able to do what we want to do. Our third key around facing the future and considering the showstoppers is preparing to pivot, because no matter how good you are at predicting the future, you're going to get it wrong. So I'm going to give you a quick example of this. 
Because you've got to be as flexible as that future is uncertain. Netflix, again, I, I love this company because they've actually done it right. So Netflix started, as we all know, I think, by competing with Blockbuster by sending DVDs in the mail. There were these little discs. You'd put them in this little thing called an envelope. You'd take it to a box, a metal one. You'd put it in there. A few days later, someone would pick it up. A week or so later, and this is for everyone under the age of 30, by the way, because let's face it, we just don't do it anymore. They realized that this wasn't the business. This wasn't the way to compete because there was a bigger opportunity. The opportunity was being where people were. So they competed against the cable companies. They pivoted. And they realized that, you know what? If we're competing against the cable companies, we can compete against the cinemas. And if we compete against the cinemas, well, wait a second. Maybe we should own the content itself. And so they pivoted, they pivoted, they pivoted. Now they're the biggest buyer and maker of content in the United States. From mailing DVDs to essentially owning the entire value chain. And now they're defending, which is kind of cool, because most companies get good at something, and then they, they, they keep doing it until they fail. So now let's see what happens. They've spent so much money, they've got no choice. Now here's an example from my own personal experience. This is a large company that was a, the number one player of supply into the automotive industry. They came to us and they had a very, very simple question. Do we or don't we build a multi-billion dollar factory out in some physical location right at the edge of Europe? And they said, you know, we, we think that the, the automotive industry, the combustion engine, has got a nice clear path up until about 2045. So we think, we think we're solid. What do you think? So we went and we talked about China and regulations and Uber and electrification and, 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 and zip cars and all of these things and, and globalization and, and possible trade wars, all of these things seven years ago that are all kind of coming to pass today. And they realized that, you know what, the world is kind of an uncertain place. We need to be more flexible. So what they did is they did two things. Instead of building that factory, they built containerized solutions. Essentially, being able to increase the size of their factory when demand went up and take it away when demand went down. And they did something that the number one player in the industry never considered doing before. They built an exit strategy. They said, this industry is going to eventually die. So how do we know when the peak is? So we sell it so someone else is stuck with us. That comes from having flexibility at both a strategic and an operating level an entirely different view than the executive team had when they first went in. So again, what are those three keys to meeting uncertainty and change? One, face the future. Realize that looking at your last year's performance or 10 years' performance or comparing yourself to all your peers and drawing a straight line isn't going to help. Understand how trends and uncertainties and behaviors are changing and build it into your vision. Two, consider the showstoppers, not just what it takes to get you to your vision, but what could stop you from achieving it. And three, be prepared to pivot, because you have to be as flexible as the future is uncertain. And if you do that, well, you've got a chance to meet the future and succeed. Thank you very much.